This is Natalie Jensen. I have known Natalie since June of 2010 when she had the <laughs> pleasure of meeting me. Um, her advisor at Aurora is a good friend of mine, Donna Robinson. And Donna goes, Eric, Eric, I've got one. I've got one for you. I'm not even to the others about it. He's all yours. I go, okay, good. I came over and I saw her at the CA. I read three lines. That's enough. Yep, I'm good. So poor Natalie comes into Aurora for her, you know, welcome to Aurora Day in June. And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, come over here. I'd like to meet. And she meets a short little bald man. Back of it. He's all excited. And he talks her ear off. And she's like, this is great, I think. I said, you're going to do research with me. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fantastic. I'm so glad you're coming. Blah, 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 blah. And she eventually went London. Natalie was an absolute pleasure at Aurora. Fish in three years with her uh, major in sociology, minor in uh, biology and chemistry. Realized she didn't need to come back for a fourth year because she was done. We're all that efficient. Played tennis while she was there. She was an RA. She was home student government. She went to Guatemala on her own basically for four, four weeks. You name it, she did it. And then when she wanted to go to graduate school, she wanted to ask my opinion. I'm going, but you're going for sociology. Yes, but I still respect your opinion. That doesn't get said very often to me. So I, I'm always excited when I hear that. And I basically said, you follow your heart, kid. You do what you want. Of course, she got into all the places she applied. So now, she went back home. She went back home to Kansas. She is working on her master's. She'll be soon, two weeks, right? Two weeks away from her defense and, uh, with a, a master's in sociology focusing on medical sociology. After that, we don't know what she's going to do because she's young and the world is her oyster. I am extremely proud of her. She has always, always, always excelled. And she has never given me a reason that she can't do something. Her attitude is, let's go ahead and try. And whatever happens, happens. And I know that's what she's going to do in the future. Please feel free to listen. Feel free to ask questions. When she's done, she takes questions. She's very friendly. No, she's not bold. Thank you so much for coming.
This is actually something very similar to what Engel wrote in his 1977 paper, but I came up with a case study um, to kind of demonstrate what the difference is. So my case is, assuming that you are a physician in the emergency room, and a 45-year-old male comes in and he presents with all of the symptoms of a heart attack. So he does have, he is having a heart attack. And you find it to be caused by a blockage in one of his coronary arteries. So I have a picture of the heart with the arteries. It's, that's one of the really common causes of heart attacks, so it's no surprise. So the question is, from a biomedical perspective, and this is a question for you to answer, how do you save his life? What's the emergency treatment you do in the ER to save his life? There's a picture of it on the slide. Uh -huh. Good, yeah. So you, you'll put a catheter through his femur, run it up, um, put a stent or a balloon. It's called angioplasty. That's the name of the procedure. So that's exactly right. That's how you save his life in the moment. Um, it's a split second decision. It's a cure for... The, the biological thing that went wrong. So, what caused the man's heart attack? And I'll go with that. It's not a trick question. What caused his heart attack from the biological, biomedical perspective? Good, yeah. So, he had a blockage in one of his coronary arteries. Um, it's simple enough. But, when you get to know this man, um, you find out that not only does he have a blockage in one of his coronary arteries, which I can't stress enough. Um, it seems like there's a misconception that the biopsychosocial model discounts the importance of the biological, and that's really not the case. We absolutely um, give credit to the biological cause. That's incredibly important. But we also find out that this 45-year-old man lost his job, and he's been unemployed for eight months, so he's had a drastic increase in his stress level. So this is kind of playing to the psychological side, maybe a little bit sociological too. But he's under immense stress, maybe some anxiety because he, he's lost his job. Another thing, he doesn't eat healthy. So he grew up in a household where he was allowed to eat whatever he wanted. Um, his parents maybe didn't know a lot about nutrition, and so he had access to pretty much any food that he could eat. He's also expected to provide for his family, so we see this social cost here. As he's the, the primary breadwinner in his home, there's a lot of stress on him to, to bring home food and you know, be able to feed his family. And finally, um, his job search takes up most of his time, so his time for exercise is very limited. He might not have exercised at all before, but he certainly isn't now. So, all of these things said, this is another question for you. Um, how do you save his life taking these additional factors into consideration? Good, yeah, so you can definitely recommend a nutritionist to him because if he's got this problem with unhealthy eating, that's going to persist. If he had a heart attack once because of his bad eating, just fixing his heart isn't going to keep him from not having a heart attack. Um, what other things could, could be considered? Exercise, exercise. good, yeah, so getting going on an exercise plan. That's definitely important. Uh, yeah, that exercise. That was yours? Well, I think we also need to do the angioplasty. Um, if a man comes into the, the emergency room and has a heart attack, we're not just gonna tell him to go do exercise. Uh, we gotta take care of the angioplasty yeah. first. Um, what other things, other thoughts? Stress management training, mindfulness training. Good, yeah, definitely. So playing into the psychological side, it's, that's a huge problem. Um, the interesting thing here is that the cause of all of these things, or a lot of them, is that he doesn't have a job. So it's very difficult coming from the perspective of a, a primary care physician or an ER doctor that the reason he had a heart attack might have been stress caused by something that you can't treat at all. So. The next question is, what challenges will you run into when you're creating a treatment plan? So going to see a nutritionist is a great idea, and encouraging exercise is a great idea, and stress management is a fantastic idea. But what challenges are we going to run into when we're putting this plan together? Financial. 
Good, yeah, that's a huge, huge cause. That's one of probably, arguably, the biggest causes. He might not have the money to pay for it. He already doesn't have a job, and if he doesn't have health care, all of the advice in the world for, for health care isn't going to do any good. Um, what other reasons might there be? Yeah, perfect. So he's spending all of this time looking for a job and trying to provide for his family and going through all of this, this extra stress. He might not have the time to exercise or eat healthier even if he wants to. Um, what other reasons might there be? Good, yeah, so he might just be stuck in his ways. That, that might be what he's used to and he really, really likes donuts every day. That's a hard thing to give up. So definitely uh, a willingness to change is, is an issue too. Um, another thing I can think of is just lack of knowledge. So we might, as a physician, be able to provide this information and tell him, well, you need to eat healthier, but he might not know what that means. Um, because to a lot of people, that just means only eating fruits and vegetables all the time without any sort of give and take. So, so all of these things are, are really important. And so cases like this are exactly the reason why I study sociology. So um, as Dr. Ryman said, I graduated from Aurora University in 2013 with a BA in sociology. I was also pre-med with minors in bio and chemistry. And I actually didn't start out as a sociology major. I started out in biology and health science. So um, for those of you who might not be sure what you want to do, or you were sure, but now you're not so sure, I completely understand how scary it can be. And making that transition is, is often uh, a really scary thing to broach. So I got really interested in this because what I found in my biology classes is that people, bodies are, are so fascinating and there, um, there are so many pieces that have to work together perfectly for everything to happen right. But in that way, we're, we're like machines. So there are patterns and there's things that happen in cells that we can see in person to person and um, that, that makes it easy to study. It makes us very easy to understand the organs and and the processes that are going on. And, but it made me wonder what, what's different, and it's the person. So we have all of these you know, mechanical properties inside our bodies, but what makes a person different is the fact that they're a person. So that's kind of how I found my way into sociology and why I kind of approach things the way that I do now. So I want to talk a little bit about my interest in sociology, or in medical sociology specifically. And I've got four on here. I tried so hard to condense them to four because it's all interesting. But um, the first one is stigma. So this is a story I really like to tell about my trip to Guatemala. Um, it happened in 2012, and it was with uh, a Christian ministry on campus. And we went to an HIV and AIDS clinic and also a, a Red Cross headquarters, which just an aside, that's a picture of the Red Cross headquarters and they treat all of their patients of HIV and AIDS without running water, so definitely a huge need in uh, a lot of areas and a lot of room for improvement. But what happened when I went there is this community was filled with families with moms and dads and children, and what made them so unique is that every child in that community had one or both parents who had HIV or AIDS, and some children had no parents because both of them had died. So as a response to that, um, all of the churches in the area, except for one, completely ostracized them and said, obviously you have HIV and AIDS because you sinned so badly that you, you deserve this disease. And there was one, um, one church that decided that that was, that was wrong, and they took him in, and they've been taking care of him ever since. So that was kind of my first exposure to stigma. And, in the medical community. It's not just Guatemala where this happens. We see uh, stigma with mental illness, especially. That's a huge problem. And we also see HIV and AIDS stigma in the US still. But there's a whole, a whole breadth of illnesses that experience stigma. And not just illnesses. I mean, we see stigma a lot of places. But. 
Um, but that's what's got me interested in, in stigma groups. So, so the second one is about patient-doctor relationships and non-compliance. And I kind of group these together because I think that they're both important and they, they're both very connected. So as an example of the patient-doctor relationship, I went to the doctor for a checkup a couple weeks ago, and she asked me if I had any caffeine, or if I liked caffeine. And I said, well, yeah, I like Coke Zero. I'm a, to I, I'm a total Coke Zero addict. I don't even, I can't even tell you how much Coke Zero I drink, but it's like fuel. I don't know, I just, I take it in a lot. Um, so her response to that was, well, you don't drink one every day, do you? <laughs> and I said, well, like in my head I was thinking, I think that was last Saturday where I didn't finish one of my cans. So I was like, no, of course not. And she kind of moved along. But this is the perfect example of why the patient-doctor relationship is so important. Because I think if she had approached that question differently, my initial inclination wouldn't have just been to say no, because I knew I was going to get in trouble if I told her I did. I knew that she was going to tell me I shouldn't be drinking Coke Zero every day, but it's so much easier to just kind of move on from that instead of lingering in it. So the patient-doctor relationship thing is really important, and I don't think it's something people spend enough time on. And building trust with your physician is something that's really centrally important to delivering good care. So that's kind of where that, that side of it comes in. The non-compliant side, we kind of talked about a little bit already with the case study I, I presented. But what a doctor might perceive as non-compliance might be something completely different than how the patient perceives it. So a patient might be told to go home and eat healthier, but they just can't afford healthier food. So then the doctor goes in and talks to his colleagues, and he's angry, and, and says, you know, my patients, I always tell them to eat healthier and exercise more, and they never do what I tell them. But on the other end of it, the guy just couldn't afford to buy healthier food. So it's not that he's not trying to be non-compliant. He just can't afford it. Um, this is something that, if you haven't heard of Paul Farmer, he's a medical anthropologist at Harvard. And I, I have his name up there. He's one of my idols. Um, he's a really, really great, great researcher and doctor. And he works in Haiti um, several months out of the year. But one of the things he's interested in is tuberculosis. And he said doctors will, will call a person non-compliant if they don't add an addition to their hut so that they can have more room for breathing. And they might call a non-compliant if they don't walk several hours to get to the nearest physician for treatment. Um, they might call them non-compliant if they aren't able to get all of their kids out of the house so they can have time to recover. So it's, again, it might not just be that people are being non-compliant. It might be that there's some sort of disconnect between what a doctor expects and what a patient expects. So that's something that's really interesting to me. Another thing is bioethics. So I think I, I figured out that the crux of everything I'm interested in kind of starts with bioethics. So I actually have three things that really interest me with this topic that I, I kind of want to bring up. So the first one is a little bit um, less common, I would say, but the thing that really got me going with bioethics was the idea of the black market and organ trafficking. So this whole idea is that a person really desperately needs money, and they have a kidney to sell. So if a very wealthy person from another country is willing to buy that kidney, then they should be able to sell it so that they can provide food for their family. So a kidney might go for 10 years worth of salary or several months worth of salary. So it seems like an easy fix. And the libertarian side of me says, you know, a person should be able to do what they want with their body. It's their body, they should be able to sell it if they want. But you never ever see a wealthy person selling their kidney to a very poor person. So there's this obvious socioeconomic dynamic to what's happening with this illegal organ trafficking industry. And, and it's a really, really big problem. So that's kind of what got me interested in bioethics to begin with. And Nancy Shepard Hughes, whose name I also wrote, is another medical anthropologist at UC Berkeley, and she's still actively uh, hunting down organ traffickers and, and interviewing people and going undercover and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. So if that interests you, she's the one for you. But 
Um, the second thing that interested me about bioethics is we don't realize this, but almost every hospital has its own bioethicist. So those are people that consult on a daily basis about uh, what's, what's going on in the hospital and if there are any strange cases or unique circumstances or, or things that need to be taken care of that a doctor might not be sure how to proceed. So I wanted to give you an example of what a case like that might look like. So I have to admit that I've adapted these cases from a couple of stories I read in the New York Times recently, so credit goes to them. But let's say that there are two people and they each have a living will. So does anyone know what a living will is?
who has healthy mitochondria, and you allow her egg to um, kind of take care of that mitochondrial side of things, then that couple can have a healthy baby. So, as you can understand, this has brought up all sorts of ethical questions about the beginning of life and um, and what it means to you know create an embryo and all of these sorts of questions. So, with bioethics, the the further we get along in technology, the more this is going to become uh, a concern. And we see that with programs. Um, this field didn't really exist 20 or 30 years ago, but it's quickly growing, and there are PhD programs all over the country. So the fourth one is the use of biomarkers. So I, I put a list, or a, kind of a list, of some various biomarkers that we see. So basically what a biomarker is, is just a physiological measurement of a person's health. So we've got C-reactive proteins, which are basically just uh, a protein that's produced by the liver, and it rises when you have inflammation in your body. So that's the top one on the inflammatory. Um, we also see things like systolic and diastolic blood pressure, which I have to find up here. Um, systolic is pressure in arteries when the heart beats, and then diastolic is that break in the heartbeat and what the pressure is then. We also see other things like BMI and waist tip ratio, um, HDL and LDL, so how much good and bad cholesterol a person has. All of these things are, are biomarkers. So, so, the cool thing about biomarkers is that we can take those and associate them with social factors. So, I can look at a person's, for example, C-reactive protein, how much inflammation they have in their body, which is often considered uh, a measure of a person's stress, and I can see a direct connection between how many friends they have and how involved in their community they are and how much stress they have in their life. So taking these very biological mechanisms and linking them to social causes is uh, a really cool development in, in both fields. Um, one thing I should mention about this is research that's starting to happen with telomeres, which is why I do the telomere up here. So I think the easiest way to describe a telomere is basically it's like the aglet on a shoestring. So it's like the very tip of the shoestring that holds it all together. And basically, um, DNA replication can't extend all the way to the end of a chromosome. So a telomere is this just uh, basic combination of, of nucleotides that um, is just really simple and it's a repeating unit and it can kind of shorten over time and nothing bad will happen. So, uh, like I wrote on the board, progressive shortening contributes to aging. So we link decreased telomere length with a person's, uh, you know, age, aging body. So, uh, another thing, if this interests you, I have an article up here, it came out in 2010, and what they did was they compared um, African American women to white women in the United States, and they looked at their stress levels by measuring telomere length. So, what they found was that black women, on average, had a seven year shorter lifespan than white women. And they attributed that entirely to social factors, which, which is fascinating. So if telomeres um, is something that interests you, that's, that's a really, really cool, innovative new thing that's, that's happening. So, okay. Um, I kind of want to move into how I've used biology and sociology in research and what some of this um, practically looks like. So all of these things that are on the slide are things I've presented on sometimes multiple times, but all very much ingrained in biology. So the first one, which I've already talked pretty extensively about, is medical research ethics in developing countries. So we've talked about that, the one-sided bioethics. What I'm really interested in here is um, something called the, the Institutional Review Board and the FDA. So if you've ever had to do animal or human research, you probably you're familiar with the IRB. But it's um, basically this safeguard put in place to make sure that subjects are treated humanely. So what happens is going through this and going through the FDA is something that's very costly. 
so what we've started to see is institutions, instead of going through all of the hoops and finding human subjects here, can very easily take drugs to the developing world, where we have a whole bunch of people who really need money, really need food, really need water. Maybe the only hope of having their disease cured is this experimental drug. So it brings into question all sorts of ethical things about how we go about recruiting participants for medical research. Is it okay to take uh, an experimental drug to the developing world, test it on them, and then leave right after the research is done? That's something uh, that, that often gets overlooked, but a lot of drugs that we have today are, are products of something like that. So, so the other one, which you'll see more in my social justice piece too, is maternal health care in the international context. So, this is something that is really important, it's, it's continuing to grow, is this interest in maternal and child health. And I do have to digress to give you a couple of facts, just so you understand. Um, the United States has an average of 15.1 deaths of the woman per 100,000 live births, and we spend the most money per capita in the entire world. So that number, 15.1, is actually the worst in the developed world. We have the worst maternal health care in the developed world. Um, that sounds really awful, and it is, but it doesn't compare to places like Sierra Leone or Somalia, where they have one in 50 people dies um, giving birth. So, all of that said, um, a lot of my research and interest in that have been in the, the human rights, right to health perspective, as far as maternal health care goes because most women in a lot of these countries don't have access to pre and postnatal care, um, as well as labor and delivery care. So, so that's another interest of mine. Also kind of related to the maternal health side is the stigma of infertility. So this is actually what I wrote my master's on and I'm defending on in two weeks, which is um, scary. But basically the stigma of infertility is um, this idea that we live in this society, not just in the U.S., but all over the world, where motherhood is very highly valued. So if you're a woman who either decides not to have children, or you are infertile and physically can't have children, or your husband has infertility problems so you can't get pregnant, there's a lot of stigma placed on that, and a lot of women dealing with infertility feel socially isolated. So. So my interest with this has kind of uh, led to an interesting research design, which is basically um, looking at these forums where infertile women talk to one another. So you get all sorts of interesting comments said by infertile women about how they deal with, with being infertile and what stigma looks like to them. So, so that's kind of been um, the infertility side of things. And the thing that's really directly related to the biological stuff is the allostatic load scores on an Indonesian population. So, um, basically what happens is, the Indonesia, so in Indonesia they have this survey, it's called the IFLS, um, which stands for Indonesian Family Life Survey. And it started in 1991, they're in their fifth wave right now, so what a wave is, is every few years they go and they talk to the exact same people and collect the same data so they can measure if things are changing over time. So it's really cool because they send out not only all of these interviewers who interview every member of the household as well as religious organizations in the community, um, waste management programs, basically everything under the sun, schools, hospitals, primary care places. But they also have professional nurses come in who take all of these measurements. So we talked about some of them before. Um, for example, the C-reactive protein, cortisol levels, um, systolic, diastolic blood pressure, BMI. And you can take that and link it to things happening in Indonesia. So the first question I usually get is, why did I choose Indonesia? Um, which the first answer is because they have a data set available in Indonesia. But also, Indonesia is very well known for having a long tradition of familial ties. So their family is very important to them and their, their network and their community is very important to them. So when I'm studying what I'm interested in, which is social capital, so um, how much trust and reciprocity you feel 
for members of your community, um, how much you can lean on them in times of need. It's really important to be able to study a community that really values that. So I presented a project on allostatic load in, in uh, Memphis. And what allostatic load is, is basically taking all of these things and you assign a number to it, and then you turn it into a scale. So um, you get, you know, if you have a high allostatic load score, that's bad. Low is good. And we kind of just construct it that way. So that's how I did the presentation um, in Memphis. But my next step is to use a C-reactive protein. So seeing how much inflammation or how much stress on the body is a result of not having these social connections. So. If there are any questions about any of those specifically, um, I would gladly talk about them in the Q&A. So, um, moving on to how to use biology and sociology with social justice. So, first, I, I will say that a lot of the opportunities I've had with social justice have been in religious organizations. So that's been a really great outlet um, to, to do a lot of these projects. So. That said, the first one is not, um, but it's the human rights organization. So I'm not sure if this is something your campus has, but it was started on my campus while I was um, in undergrad. And we focused on a whole range of human rights issues. So I was kind of their go-to health person. So I ended up dealing with a lot of the human rights and health issues. And one of the big ones was HIV and AIDS and STIs, which as I mentioned earlier, is really largely because of of the experience I had in Guatemala. But, but that's one way, is really going through um, community outreach and involving not only your school community, but the larger community to, to make sure people are educated on these sorts of things. The next one is through um, a Christian organization. It's called the Human Wrong Campaign. So again, I was kind of the go-to person. And I decided to do maternal health, and I decided to talk about something called obstetric fistula. So obstetric fistula is something that we essentially don't see in the United States. Um, it's something that really happens as a result of not having care during labor and delivery. And it's um, basically a tear that, that leaves a woman incontinent. So you can imagine the stigma that would be associated with incontinence in these communities. And a lot of time leads, leads to really horrible social isolation. And unfortunately, it's a very quick fix. It's a very quick medical procedure. It only takes a few minutes. But, but it's something that drastically impacts the lives of a lot of women. So, so that's something that's really important to me. Um, there's a really, really good documentary. It's on YouTube called A Walk to Beautiful. So if that's something that interests you, that's a really, really good resource for that. Um, also, I've talked about this, my mission trip to Guatemala, which I just found out today that I stayed at La Union in Antigua, if anyone's, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so some people know, but, um, so I got to do a lot of really cool things. We worked with uh, a ministry, a campus ministry while we were there, and so one of the first things we did was we taught hygiene and first aid to an indigenous population. And we had to drive two hours up into the mountains to, to get to them. And this is almost like, I almost feel embarrassed telling this story, but I, first of all, I don't speak Spanish as my first language or my second language. Um, I, I kind of speak Spanish, and I was expected to teach five and six-year-olds, so I could pretty much get by on a five and six-year-old's vocabulary. But one of my questions to them was, well, what do you do if you cut your foot? So you're running and you cut your foot on a rock. This is all in broken Spanish, so I'm not going to bore you with trying Spanish. But the first kid raised his hand and he said, oh, you pee on it. And you know, all of his little friends are all snickering and I thought he was just joking around and um, his teacher said, yeah, that's exactly right. And it turns out that that's the, the advice that is given to the kids in that community. Um, they have really, really, a really awful water supply, so I'm not sure if that's the, the connection that, that's the connection I drew to that advice, but it was just something that really opened my eyes that, like I said, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot still needs to be done. So, um, that said, I also have already talked about the, the HIV AIDS community and the Red Cross headquarters. 
And like I said, that the headquarters didn't have running water, and we kind of see the Red Cross as this big entity that comes in and has lots of money and can distribute aid quickly, but um, they didn't have running sinks. So again, a lot of work needs to be done on this global front. Another thing is really simple to fuse biology, and that's um, I got to work with a nonprofit organization that was a ministry, and we worked with underprivileged kids. And the area that I was from, parts of it were 95% Hispanic. So a lot of kids um, didn't speak English at all or spoke very broken English. And just helping them with their science homework is hugely valuable. Doing that thing where you put the uh, vinegar with the baking soda and, and doing the fake volcano, that kind of stuff really, really excited kids and really got them excited about science. So I'm not sure that there's much better as far as social justice goes than getting little kids excited about education. Um, I'm also biased because I think one of my most rewarding experiences I've ever had was getting a girl who was failing at math to join math leads and really fall in love with math. So until you've had an experience like that, I'm not sure that me talking about it does justice. But another thing that's kind of on the institution level is writing grants for nonprofits. That's a huge, huge need, and I'm sure nonprofits are always looking for help in that, that arena. But I got to help uh, bring a physical activity program to a church in Kansas City, Kansas, which is, is really exciting um, because it was in an area for kids that don't have a lot of safe spaces to play outside and don't have a lot of understanding of eating healthy. And the last thing is, uh, working for this thing called the Community Toolbox. So if advocacy or nonprofit work is something that interests you, I would click around. It's just called the Community Toolbox. But I think it's one of the biggest sources of information for nonprofits and advocacy groups on the internet. And it reaches, I can't even, it's some ridiculously large number, like several million people a year go to the site and use it. So, so all of these things have, really come to me through my interest in science and things like the community toolbox. It's not that I'm directly using biology, but it's my knowledge of biology and chemistry that, that actually gave me the opportunity. So I would say that using science might not be what happens in the end, but it might be what gets you there. So it gets you in the door. So I have four pieces of advice for you. Um, the first one is, to never ever turn down an opportunity if you can help it. So I can't tell you how many times I thought I was going one direction and ended up going the opposite um, just because I didn't turn down an opportunity. And that's what got me in Guatemala. So um, you never know where life is going to take you. Yeah, the next one is surround yourself with people who support you. I know that studying the sciences or actually being in college at all is challenging at times, and you need to be around people who understand that you can't always play video games and eat pizza. Sometimes you have to you have to take the night off and study. Um, the next one is really just strictly come out of me studying for the MCAT these last few months. But that's it. Really don't quit, even when it gets really bad, because I know that it does get bad. Um, because progress happens in those moments when you think you're going to quit, and then you keep going anyway. So that's my third piece. And last, there's a guy named Ralph Derendorf, and he was a sociologist. And he gave uh, a commencement address, and I don't remember what the school was, but he said something that really stuck with me for several years. And he said, what you're doing has to be fun. It has to be something you wake up to every morning and you're excited about it and you're passionate about it. And it has to matter. You have to find something that is really going to be something that changes other people. Um, something that, that helps other people. So that is something that always resonates with me. But um, I do want to point out before I finish up that I've added a couple of other things to my list of if you're interested things. Um, so I've already mentioned Paul Farmer and Nancy Shepard Hughes, but Atul Gawande is a surgeon at Harvard and he writes uh, really, really wonderful books about being in medicine, and, and so I would definitely recommend him. Um, Charles Bosk is at UPenn, he's a sociologist, and 
He wrote a book called All God's Mistakes about genetic counseling, and it, it's borderline life-changing, I think. Um, let's see. Lutke and Fries wrote a book about diabetes in clinics, also life-changing. And if you're interested in ecology and health, this article is really good. Um, the last piece of very practical advice I want to leave you with is that if you're studying for the MCAT or if you're just struggling in any sort of science class at all, I would check out Khan Academy on YouTube because they create really, really wonderful explanatory videos about basically everything under the sun from physics to chemistry to calculus. So it's been a huge help for me and I hope that telling people about it will help you too. So um, I have my contact info and I have business cards up here if you're sick of writing. So um, don't feel like you have to write it down. But if you like writing letters, I have my address and that would be really exciting to me. Otherwise, I have my email. So um, thank you so much. I decided that global health was the thing I was going to do. And that's, I, I can't say other than I woke up one morning and knew that I was going to study global health. Um, and it just turns out that biology wasn't the way that I ended up studying it. So I, I was too selfish to give up biology entirely. And the way to do that is just to kind of make up your own thing and combine them together and, and go from there. So. It's, it's this emerging discipline, and there, there aren't too many of us doing exactly what I'm interested in. But yeah, it's sometimes about 14 years and a half, so. Yeah, so I would love to go 
going to academic medicine. So teaching in a medical school, I, I really ideally like to get an MD PhD. So um, infectious diseases and tropical medicine is what interests me the most. So I'd like to study that and then be able to teach medicine and, and practice. And I, I'd also like to get into the nonprofit sector. So Paul Farmer to me is like the perfect model of what can happen because he started this big nonprofit called Partners in Health in Haiti. And he, I think he says, um, there's a book called Mountains Beyond Mountains. It's his biography. It's really good. But he says that he worked in Haiti before it was cool to work in Haiti. So um, he's been there since the 80s. And he works there. Um, he So he lives in the slums in Haiti when he goes there. And then when he teaches at Harvard, he lives in a church basement. And all of the money that he makes from Harvard goes into his nonprofit. So it's, it's a really, really interesting model for how to live and, and how to how to function and, and do all of these things. So if you haven't read anything about him, he, he's really good. But that would be my, my ideal. Uh, um, with regards to the statistics you gave about the maternal death here in the United States, that, have you found any link between our advanced maternal age uh, compared to other developed countries? Yeah, um, that's a really good question because that's definitely an aspect of it that we haven't had to address before. But um, I feel like that number might be a little bit misleading because overwhelmingly, it's people who don't have health insurance who are um, having maternal, maternal death. So that figure includes all of the people who are in really bad poverty in the US, and they're usually the ones who are experiencing it. So it's not necessarily age. Yeah, no, I, I don't think, maybe a little bit, but overwhelmingly, it's, it's the socioeconomic. While 140, go ahead and stick around. The rest of you, I greatly appreciate you coming and to give her one more hand.